I'll be going over the solutions to Google Kickstart Round C 2020. So starting from the first problem, uh, this is basically a kind of like a string matching problem. So if what you could do is you could use some string matching algorithm like KMP, Z function, or hashing. And those are unnecessary if you don't know them. And it's actually faster to just use a simple method. So what you do is you start from every possible, like you check every possible ending index for the countdown. So I check um, I will be the ending index. And then starting from, and then I'll check that the ending index is one. And then I'll check that second last uh, index is two, and I'll check check the third last index is three, and so on. So that's what the for loop inside here does. It makes sure that, um, make sure that the jth last element in this subarray is supposed to be j. And if it's not j, then that means that this subarray doesn't work. So then um, this Boolean flag is set to false, and then the break stops. And then the answer is increased by one if, the answer is increased by one if, the entire subarray matches uh, this pattern. So obviously this solution works in O of K times N time, but then this, this solution is obviously O of K times N, but actually it's O of N because, because we break whenever the subarray doesn't work. So if OK is set to false, then the loop doesn't run anymore. And the reason why this makes it linear time is because, so let's say, uh, so let's say that, yeah, I'll just give an example. So k equals to four, and then we have three, two, one, and then uh, two, one. So we start checking from, uh, I'll just add a few more. So we start checking from like here because we need a subarray of length four. And then this is, is on one, so we just skip this. And then this, we check the next index. This is one, so then uh, this is one, this matches. We go on to the next index, second last index, and then this is two, this also matches. And then this is three, this also matches. But then we don't get a four, so then we stop. Then we move on to this index. And it is isn't one, so we just continue, and then move on to this index, and then again we check that one works, two works, but then uh, we don't have a three. So if you notice, in total, like each uh, e each number will only be marked once, and that's because if like we can't mark the two, uh, if we were to mark this again. That means that this is a three, but this contradicts. This is just contradicting. So, uh, in fact, like each number will only be marked once, which is, explains why there's a linear total time complexity. So problem two. The important thing to realize is that since we want to make sure that. Um, so we want to make sure that like every time we add a poly polyomino, like it's always supported. That means that if we have uh two, if we have two like uh if we have two blocks and one block is on top of the other, so like this a and this o, and if they're from different, if they're from different like parts, then that means that the we have to put. Uh, o first, and then we can put A. So we kind of have this relation between pairs of these letters. So you have these pairs, meaning that uh, the first letter in the pair has to go before the second letter in the pair. So for example, a few, uh, we'll just go through each adjacent pair, like top bottom pair inside the matrix, and then we'll create this graph. So for the first sample case, what we'll create is, so we have these letters, A, O, uh, Z, and M. Go through, you find that A is on top of O. So that means that O must be before A. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll add an edge from A to O. 
meaning that O has to come before A. And then we do the same thing. Uh, we already have an edge for this, and then O has to be come before M as well. So we add this. And then lastly, Z has to come before O. So we add this. So now we have a graph. And as long as like this graph doesn't have a cycle, then that means you can always find an order. And we can find an order using topological sort. So Z O A M is one possible topological sort for this graph. And that's the answer. And if you notice that in this graph here, we have an edge from X to F because of this pair. And we also have an edge from F to X, which, um, and this causes the directed graph to have a cycle. And in the topological sort, if we detect that there's a cycle, then that means there's no answer. So that's why the answer is negative one in this case. And the code is pretty simple. So I have a set to store all characters which appear in the matrix. And then like I input the matrix and then for each adjacent um, row, for each pair of adjacent rows, I check each adjacent like bottom up pair and then I, I add the edge into the adjacency list. And then I do a topological, I do a topological sort on the graph to find the answer. Yeah, that's basically it. I won't go in, into the topological sort in detail. And yeah, you can find that yourself if uh, you're not familiar with it. And problem C though. So first thing you need to notice in this problem is that the values in the array are really small. It's only up to 100 in absolute value. So this means that the maximum sum of a subarray will be 10 to the 7. And this also means that <clears throat> um, because, because we want the sum to be a perfect square, that means we only have to check for up to like 3,000. And we have to check up to 3,000 uh, different perfect squares as the sum. So, so what we do is the first part of the array basically calculates uh, the maximum negative sum and maximum positive sum, which will be stored in S1 and S2. And then I have a count array which stores, this will store the number of the counts of the prefix sums uh, of the array. So, so at first I add, at first there's an empty prefix sum, which is zero. But then I add, I add S1 just to like, because the maximum negative sum is S1, I'm going to add S1 to all the indexes when I access this array so that like I won't access any negative index in this uh, indexes. So at the start, the prefix sum is, uh, T is the prefix sum and at the start it's zero. And then as I process each element, I add uh, A of I to the prefix sum. And then uh, at the end of the loop, I add this prefix sum into the frequency array C. So, and then the inner loop here is what counts the number of subarrays. So, um, so since S2 is the maximum possible sum, well, we only need to iterate for J uh, starting from zero and until you know, we, we, uh, if, if J squared is greater than S2, then we know we can stop. So uh, that's, that's, that explains this condition here. And then what we do is, um, in order to have an subarray with, sum, with a sum of j squared, since the current prefix sum has, right, so since the current prefix sum has a sum of t, if we want the, the subarray ending at i to have a sum of j squared, and that means that we need a prefix sum over here to be t minus j squared. So that's why I query for the counts of the prefix sums, which are t minus j squared. And I add that to the answer because each prefix sum with a sum of t minus j squared will give me a subarray, which has a sum of j squared. Yeah, and that's basically it for 
problem C. And for the last problem, the last problem is pretty standard if you've done like some if you've done a lot of binary index tree or segment tree problems before. So So I'm going to maintain I'm going to maintain uh, four uh, binary index trees. In each binary index tree, I can uh, update a single element. I can, I can also query for sum of a range. So in the first binary index tree, I'll store a0, a1, a2, and so on. In the second binary index tree, I'll store 0 times a0. Oh, yeah, actually. Uh, like the sign will flip, like yeah, like this, and so on. In the second binary index tree, I'll store a negative one times a one, two times a of two, uh, negative three times a of three, four times a of four, and so on. And then the last two binary index trees are just pretty much the same, but then they start with a negative instead of they start ne as negatives instead of positives, so basically like this. Okay, so let's see how we, we can answer a query. So let's say that we wanted, let's say that we wanted the sum of like, Let's say our query was the subarray from like from one to two. In this case, we just need to query the sum of like this binary index tree at this range, and that will give us our answer. Okay, and I'll give one more example. So let's say you want to query the sum of two to four. In this case, we'll use We'll use this subarray. So we'll, we'll first query the sum of this subarray. But then notice that this starts at two and not one. So that means we need to modify it somehow so that we can we need to modify it somehow so that this um so that this entire like sum will become one times a two uh minus two times a three plus three times a four. And the way you do that is we simply take this and we subtract one copy of this from this so that this two becomes the one, this three becomes a two, and this four becomes a three. And yeah, that's pretty much the general idea. So I'll, I'll go through the code and it might be a bit more clear. So this uh, function apply basically changes an element in array into x. So at the start, I input the array and I call this function. And at the end, I set all of the, I set the entire array back to zero. And then what, whenever I have an update, I also just call this function directly. How this function works is, um, so, this basically gives me the parity of i. So if i is even, then this is zero. If i is odd, then this is one. So, so let me just, so this is f zero, this is f one. This is f zero of zero, this is f one of zero. And this is f zero of one, and this is f one of one. So basically to determine the sign of the element, I basically use the parity of i. And then I update a of i into x by adding x minus a of i. And I basically do the same for the other. I do a similar thing for all four binary index trees. So then when we query, we also look at the parity of l. So 
the first thing we need to do is we need to, uh, whatever the case, we'll, we'll find the sum of a range in F1. So for example, like back in this, this case, um, if we want the sweetness of subarray one, two, we query, we first query the sum of this. So depending on the parity of the left bound, we choose F1 of zero or F1 of one. And then you basically just, yeah, basically query the sum from L to R. But then like we might need to fix, um, we might need to fix the coefficients like this. So basically we might need to subtract a few copies of F0 so that in this example, the two will become a one. So in general, we will need to subtract, in general, we'll need to subtract L minus one copies so that the L over here will become a one. So that's what you do, you just uh, subtract L minus one multiplied by the sum of F zero in the range of L to R. And that gives the answer for this query and we add that to the total answer. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So, uh, yeah, so cool. So I hope this was helpful to you and thanks for watching.